This is part three of the chapter 13 lectures, and in this part of the lectures, we're going to be talking about intermolecular forces. This is a new topic uh, to us, or maybe I should say this is the first time that intermolecular forces are going to be introduced in this course. So um, I'm going to first give you kind of an overview of the types of forces and what types of molecules they would occur in, but then I'm going to go through each one and give you specific examples. So an intermolecular force, or abbreviated IMF, is defined right here with a, I'm putting a box around the definition. So these are the attractive forces that occur between molecules. So we talked about ionic and covalent bonding, and that occurs within the molecule. That holds the atoms together, or it holds the ions together. But these intermolecular forces, which occur, um, they are the attractive forces between two different molecules. And so what we'll find that they all have in common is it has to do with opposite charges attracting. So one molecule will be uh, somehow a little bit negative, the other one will have a little bit positive, and those two molecules then will be attracted to each other. Now intermolecular forces are important in so many areas of discussion, but you can see the bullet points here, these are just a few of the things and the properties of liquids and um, that are dependent on, in part, intermolecular forces. The last slide in this video, I have a summary chart that will let you know how the strength of the intermolecular forces, forces impact the properties that we've talked about in part one of these lectures. So that's a very helpful slide. It's the last slide in this particular lecture. So before we get to the last slide, we have to do several other slides. And what I'd like to do is just introduce to you the three types of intermolecular forces that we are talking about in this class and in just a general overview of the type of molecules. Then after this slide, I'll go through each one individually and then we'll do a couple of uh, practice problems to see if we can apply um, what uh, the, the forces to actual molecules. So the three types of forces uh, that when we talk about them are going to be London dispersion, dipole-dipole, and hydrogen bonding. And in this chart, going from number one to number three, they are in order of the weakest to the strongest. Um, now, uh, one thing, when we talk about the relative strength of the different forces, we uh, I want to mention that the size of the molecule also matters. So usually when we're comparing strength, we'll compare similar sized molecules to each other because the larger the molecule gets, the more opportunity for interaction it has. And so those intermolecular forces even become more dominant. So um, we're just talking about, uh, in general, that London dispersion forces are going to be the weakest of the three. Dipole-dipole is moderate, and then hydrogen bonding is the strongest of those three when we're comparing things that are similar. Now the types of molecules in general, and remember in the next three slides I'm going to give you specifics, but London dispersion is the force that is the primary force of nonpolar molecules. So we'll have to review what that means. Dipole-dipole, it's the prominent force in polar molecules. And then hydrogen bonding has very specific things that have to occur for it to be hydrogen bonding. It has to have a hydrogen that's bonded to either a nitrogen, an oxygen, or a fluorine within a molecule. And these three are the most electronegative elements. And so they really try to draw electrons toward themselves. 
And so that creates, you'll see a very strong uh, negative. So we have a positive and a negative. So in my mind, hydrogen bonding is going to be the easiest to identify because it's so specific. You have to have a hydrogen that's bonded to a nitrogen, an oxygen, or a fluorine. And if that is not present in your molecule, then it doesn't have hydrogen bonding. So that's just an overview of the three types. Let's take a look at each one specifically to see if we can understand why there's a, an attractive force and then what types of molecules specifically. So when I say nonpolar, how do we look at a formula and identify something as nonpolar, for example? So I am going to start with London dispersion and go on to dipole-dipole, then hydrogen bonding. And so London dispersion, or up here I wrote, or van der Waals forces. And I added this because several semesters ago, I had a student that was either preparing for or taking um, one of the standard exams, like the HESI or the TEAS. And as in her preparation and, and, and all this, she came across van der Waals forces. And so as we were talking about intermolecular forces, she related that back to these London dispersion forces. So they are the same thing. So if you're preparing for a test like that and you come across a van der Waals force, remember that it's the same as this London dispersion. For me, these are the hardest to draw and illustrate. Um, I took picture or illustrations uh, from a textbook. And so what happens is, um, here's the molecule in the middle. So this is the little, I think it's supposed to be a methane. Here it is, that's the molecule. Okay. And then the gray area is the electron cloud. And now electrons are going to be moving all around. If something's nonpolar, it means that the electrons are shared equally uh, or, uh, in this case, uh, spread equally around in the uh, molecule. And so there's not positives or negatives. And so what happens is the electrons get moving and they might kind of congregate in more than one area in the motion. In the motion. So if you notice on this side of the molecule, they have written that the negative charge has kind of become concentrated. And then the other one gets, I think of it as like being in sync and so now this side of this molecule becomes negative. And because one side is negative, we know then the other side would be positive. So then this side is positive and this side is positive. And so then what happens is the positive on the one molecule is attracted to the negative on the other. So there is an attraction there. Opposite charges attract. Now you might think, what? Um, but what's happening is it is going, the electrons are moving, and as they're moving around, because they're not stationary and static, I, they get in sync with each other. And so then what happens is you get concentrations of positives and negatives, and it ends up that the positive and negative from different molecules are next to each other, and that makes an attraction. It's not a bond, it's like a magnet. Now, it makes sense that this would be a relatively weak force, right? Because then the electrons keep moving, and so it doesn't stay that way all the time. But in this motion, we get this concentration of, of positive and negative. And just recall from chapter 11, this little squiggly line is a lowercase delta, and it means partial. So they have the little delta negative, that would be a partial negative, and the delta positive is a partial positive. That is different than a whole charge, like a plus one and a minus one, which would come from an electron transferring. 
So it's kind of hard to imagine, but the electrons are moving around and the electron density gets uh, more congregated on one side and that becomes negative, leaving the other side partially positive. And if the other one is in sync with it, then it can have negative near the other one's positive and they attract. Um, so again, all molecules would have this because they all have electrons moving around, but this is the only force that occurs in a nonpolar molecule. So what I have found as I move through chemistry, there's a few things that if I remember, um, and I remember as nonpolar molecules, I can get really far with this information, and here's what it is. So what I need you to memorize and commit to your uh, mind is diatomic elements are nonpolar. So if you recall from chapter 11, uh, nonpolar means the electrons are distributed evenly. So there's not really a positive and negative charge that sits there. This positive and negative in a uh, London uh, forces occurs because of the motion of the electrons. So we have these diatomic elements, two atoms of the same type sharing electrons, and that is nonpolar. Their electrons are equally distributed, and so the only positives and negatives they would get is from the motion of their electrons. So diatomic elements, remember that, they're always nonpolar. The second category, and I'm gonna put a big exclamation mark here, this is gonna help us for the next chapter, and that is hydrocarbons. Hydrocarbons are nonpolar compounds. Now, I might not have mentioned hydrocarbons before. However, at this point in the course, I feel like we should be able to reason that, right? So hydro is hydrogen, carbon is carbon. And so hydrogen, hydrocarbons contain only hydrogen and carbon. That's it. So they could have formulas like CH4, it could be C6H14, they could write it like CH3, CH2, CH2, CH3. I don't care how they write it in a formula if all you see are carbons and hydrogens. In my mind, I think of them like best friends. They share everything equally and that makes them nonpolar. So any hydrocarbon is always nonpolar. If you can remember those two things, diatomic elements and hydrocarbons are nonpolar, it gets you really pretty far. Now other common examples are when carbon is surrounded by all the same element. So here's other pretty common ones like CO2, so carbon surrounded by two oxygens, same or CCl4, carbon tetrachloride, so carbon surrounded by four chlorine. So anytime carbon has the same element around it, that is also nonpolar. And carbon tetrachloride is a pretty common nonpolar compound that they use, so that one shows up a lot as well. So to identify if something has a van der Waals force only, it would have to be a nonpolar compound. And so the again, these big categories can help you. So diatomic elements, hydrocarbons, and then carbon that has the same element around it. Um, if you need to go back as well in chapter 11, that is where we talked about and learned about using Lewis structures, polar and nonpolar molecules. Okay, so London dispersion are the weakest of the forces. They're caused by the motion of the electrons in nonpolar molecules. It is the um, significant attractive force. So the second type of interaction is a dipole-dipole interaction. Now, dipole-dipole, if you notice, some of the markings look the same. So I have a positive there, a partial positive there, and a partial positive, and a partial positive. And then I have here a partial negative, a partial negative, a partial negative. And the attractive force 
is the attraction between the positive and the negative. So that's similar to what I was just talking about, right? That the intermolecular attractions are really between the positive and negative with, uh, between the molecules. This is what is different. In London dispersion forces, those positive and negatives are created when the electrons are moving around. So that's a temporary positive and negative because the electrons keep moving around. In dipole-dipole attractions, this is what we call a permanent dipole. Okay, a dipole just means a separation of the charge, and that means a positive and a negative. The difference here is it's not caused by the electrons moving, it's caused by the elements not sharing equally the electrons. So Sometimes, especially when we're first learning, all of these ideas can be a little confusing, which I feel like is normal, and that's what we, it requires us to practice, not always get the right answer, and try to then figure it out, um, because uh, it's not like a set of rules. It's not like necessarily solving a math problem. You're encountering different molecules, and so you have to try to apply what you know, and then if you get the wrong answer, you have to figure out, okay, why what was I missing? What did I need to fill in? So as you try to learn this, just because it feels a little confusing, don't just shut it down and say, well, I can't do that. That's a little confusing. You have to try, try to apply what you know. And then if, it, if, if, it, if you don't get the right answer, figure out, okay, what was I looking at wrong until you can get to know it. So, um, this one to me is uh, polar compounds or something that you might have to practice. And so for polar, this is what I look at. I look for a variation, I look for a variation of elements. I look for having carbons and hydrogens with an oxygen or carbons and hydrogens with a nitrogen or just different elements altogether. Like maybe I have a sulfur and a chlorine. Um, and so when you get different elements, um, they often don't share electrons equally. So we can always go back to trying on small molecules to try to draw the Lewis structure and see if we see if they have lone pairs in the center. And so there's things we can try, but as, we, as you progress forward in chemistry, you want to develop some, through practice, ways to figure out if something's polar or nonpolar by looking at it. So I wrote some examples, and I don't have any big categories, but these are all one, uh, molecules that have different elements. So for example, this one, this is carbon, and it has two hydrogens and the oxygen. That's this example here. So when you look at the carbon in the middle, it's surrounded by different elements that are not going to share equally. And this carbon-oxygen bond, carbon and oxygen never share equally, so that's going to create something that's polar. They have different electronegativities. Now then I have this HCN, so again, if I look at it, here's carbon in the middle, and it's surrounded by two different elements. Carbon and nitrogen don't share equally. Now carbon and hydrogen might share equally, but carbon and nitrogen don't. They have different electronegativities. That's gonna create a dipole because their electrons are not shared equally, and that's what happens. Um, here, there's a carbon, and it has a whole bunch of hydrogens around it. They would share equally, and then there's a chlorine on it. So we're looking for molecules that have different elements. And even if it was a larger molecule, I'd be looking for different elements added onto it, like oxygens or chlorines, and um, trying to see, okay, that's not going to share equally. I will mention in really large molecules, sometimes they can have areas that are polar 
and areas that are nonpolar. And we'll talk about that a little bit more in chapter 14 because it really has an impact in how they behave. So we're kind of looking at small things here, but big molecules, sometimes they can do a little bit of everything. The other one, last example I have here is a hydrogen with a chlorine. It's two different elements, and usually, it's not 100% true, but if I was just looking at it, usually two different elements don't share equally, which would create the positive and the negative. So dipole-dipole inter interactions might be the hardest ones to try to identify, but as you, because uh, there's not really a big category, so my generalization is look for molecules that contain a variety of elements, and then you can start thinking, okay, I bet those aren't going to share equally. Now, if you guess one is polar and you find out it's not polar, then you want to look a little closer and say, okay, why would these share equally in this situation? Just don't be afraid to try because that's how you're going to learn. Now the last one, and in all honesty, I probably should start with hydrogen bonding. One, those of you in biological sciences, hydrogen bonding is immensely uh, important and it has a, a big impact on biological systems. Um, but two, it's really easy to identify. So hydrogen bonding is so specific. It has to have one of these three types of bonds. Now in the previous slide, I had this. And if we look at it, if you look real quick, you're like, oh, well, that has an oxygen and a hydrogen, but it doesn't. Look, it has a carbon and a hydrogen and a carbon and an oxygen. So this would be not hydrogen bonding because O is not bonded to H. So just because O and H are in the same molecule doesn't make it hydrogen bonding. The O and the H have to be together. So here's water, and I love the example of water. So water has uh, a hydrogen-oxygen bond, and what happens is the oxygen is more electronegative, it becomes negative, and the hydrogens become positive. So then in the hydrogen bonding, this is negative, and it will be attracted to the positive of the hydrogens. And, and you could keep drawing it, um, but that right there is the hydrogen bond, the hydrogen from a different molecule being attracted to the oxygen, nitrogen, or fluorine of the other one. So water is a really good example of hydrogen bonding. So here's just some that, there, that would be hydrogen bonding. There is the OH. Okay, we see water has an OH. HF would be the HF bond. And then NH3 has an NH bond. I could choose any one. So honestly, for me, when I was first learning this, if, if the question, and we'll see on the next slide, was just what type of intermolecular force, go with, uh, see if it's hydrogen bonding first, because that's so specific. If it's not hydrogen bonding, then look and see if it is polar or nonpolar. That would be the next question, but at least you've reduced it to 50-50. So I have a couple examples, I have two examples to be exact, um, where we'll try to do the forces. Now what I would encourage you to do is pause the video and you just try to look at your notes and you try to see if you can figure out which one is which. And then you can restart the video and I'm gonna go over the answers. So I, I, this is what I would do. I would go ahead and pause and try. All right, so. Now I'll give you the answers. So this looks like carbon with iodine, but it's chlorine. This is going to have London dispersion. I'm just gonna say London D. Now the reason behind it is, if I look at it, it's a diatomic element, and that's nonpolar. Okay, HF. So this fits, this is hydrogen bonding. 
which is a special type of London dispersion. I, I didn't even, I didn't mention that. It just hit my mind. Um, but if you look back at hydrogen bonding and how the attraction is, uh, hydrogen bonding is just a special type of dipole-dipole. It's just extra strong because it involves the three most electronegative elements. Okay, so this has HF. Okay, letter C is London dispersion, if you got that one. And the reason is this is a hydrocarbon. It contains only hydrogens and carbons, and hydrocarbons are nonpolar, which is the force of the London, uh, which is the molecule of the London dispersion. Letter D, I see right here a nitrogen and a hydrogen, so that is hydrogen bonding. And then HBr, this is a dipole dipole, and the reason I would have thought that is it's two different elements. So they're not going to share equally. And so oftentimes two different elements are polar. Now where intermolecular forces become important is when we're comparing we can see what has stronger or weaker forces. So on the next slide we're going to figure out what force it is and identify the stronger and weaker one. Okay, so it says which species in each pair has a stronger IMF, which is intermolecular force. So again, I would, let, I would pause, and what you're gonna do is identify the types of forces and then pick the one that's stronger. Okay, so I'll give you the answers. So CO2, CO2, it is a carbon surrounded by the same element, in this case, oxygen. So it is nonpolar. So it is London dispersion. I'm just putting LD here because of the space. And then water, just memorize water has hydrogen bonding. Water has an OH. And water is polar. Like these are things you should know about water. It's just, it's very helpful. All right, so which one has the stronger? The water, because it has hydrogen bonding. Okay, CO2 is a London dispersion. We just did that. Then HBr, so HBr is dipole dipole. It's two different elements. So dipole-dipole is strongest. Okay, and so letter C, HBr is dipole-dipole, dipole-dipole. This is hydrogen bonding, so water is the strongest. Now this last example are just atoms. So atoms wouldn't have, um, wouldn't, can't really be polar, it's just an atom. So they can't share differently because they're not polar. They can't have hydrogen bonding, there's no hydrogens. So atoms um, just have the electrons and so both of them have London dispersion forces. And this example is here because sometimes we encounter this. So they both have the same forces. So then if two uh, substances have similar forces, what will distinguish which is stronger is the size of the molecule, or in this case, the atom. And the bigger they are, the more electrons they have, the more interaction that they can have. And so when we see two with London dispersion, then the larger one, has the strongest forces. And you really can just look at the molar masses as a quick way to figure that out. So in this case, helium neon, if you look on the periodic table, is larger. And so we would expect it to have a stronger attraction within the neon atoms when comparing to the hydrogen atoms. Now where all of this leads us in this chapter, when we're talking about um, 
liquids and their properties and intermolecular forces, it leads us to the, the idea of comparing different liquids and their properties and how their forces influence those. In chapter 14, we'll learn a little bit more about um, how the nonpolar, polar, and the hydrogen bonding influence solubility. But in this chapter, we want to look at how the forces uh, will impact the um, different properties. And so this is a summary, and I this is a very helpful summary for me when I think about these different properties. So on the left-hand column is what strong things with stronger intermolecular forces we have, and on the right hand is weaker. And if you notice, they're just the opposite. You really wouldn't have to have both columns. I just did. And so what helps me is everything under here is influenced by stronger forces. And this is why I like it. So for example, if they tell me that something has a lower vapor pressure, if I'm comparing two things, I could also tell you that things with lower vapor pressures have higher boiling points. Or I could tell you that things with lower vapor pressures tend to have higher surface tensions or things with lower vapor pressures tend to have stronger intermolecular forces. They're all connected, right? Or looking on the other angle, I could say, okay, weaker intermolecular forces give me a higher vapor pressure, and things with higher vapor pressures tend to have lower melting points, and things with lower melting points would tend to have lower boiling points. Like, it's all connected. So I like this summary because it doesn't uh, separate all the properties, but instead puts them together and says, okay, I can't predict what the number would be. Like I can't say, oh, water boils at 100 degrees Celsius because of uh, that's not what we're asking. But if I had something like water, which is H2O, and methane, which is CH4, this has hydrogen bonding, and this has, it's a hydrocarbon, so it has London dispersion. So this one is a, when comparing, this has stronger forces, this one has weaker forces. So in comparison, I can't tell you numbers, but I can tell you that I think water is going to have a higher boiling point than methane because of the, of the forces. Or I could say water is going to have a higher surface tension than methane because of the forces. So um, it's all about comparison. We're not gonna come up with numbers. We're not gonna know how dramatic the differences are, um, but it will let me know. Or here's another, let me erase this part. Another thing, I'm trying to remember the temperature. Uh, let me see if I can look up really quick. I wanna look up the boiling point of methane. Let me look it up really quick because I want to show you. I want to give you another example. Okay, so the boiling point of water, boil, boiling point is 100 degrees Celsius. The boiling point of methane is negative 161.6 degrees Celsius. Okay, if I know those numbers, if, if I didn't know the forces, but I knew this, I could tell you, okay, methane has a lower boiling point, so methane would have a weaker intermolecular force, right? Or water has a higher boiling point, so I bet that water would have a higher melting point. Or water has a lower vapor pressure than methane. So if I know their boiling points and I know which is higher or lower, it can also tell me about some of the other properties in general. I can't get any numbers from all of this. So what you need to be able to do is kind of move within this summary uh, table uh, so that if you can compare forces, you could predict, oh, that has stronger forces, so it would I would expect it to have a higher boiling point. 
or that has a lower vapor pressure. So I think that would have a higher surface tension. So you just need to be able to uh, try to put those properties together. Now, don't be discouraged about uh, intermolecular forces. They are something we have to kind of practice and look at examples and have experience, uh, experience with. So if you feel like, I still quite don't get intermolecular forces, keep practicing, try working problems, and then when you get to one that you're not sure about, let's talk about it. Um, that's really where you start with these things because in a way, they're concrete, but in a way, they're kind of abstract. So um, good luck with it. And again, always ask me for clarification. I'm happy to help you.